Well, greetings, friends, in the lovely name of Jesus, and welcome to another episode of Bible Talk. Today we are uh, discussing greetings, friends, in the lovely name of Jesus. Welcome to another episode of Bible Talk. Today we are discussing the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So get your Bibles, get your notebooks, and get your pens, pencils, something to write with, because we're going to be covering a lot of ground today, and I'm sure uh, you will be excited about the things that we're going to be talking about. We're, hopefully, we'll be having a guest just a little bit later on after prayer, but uh, I want to encourage you to be with us each weekday at this same time, 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, USA. And uh, we will have, uh, all this week, we're planning on talking about the kingdom of God. More particularly, the kingdom parables of Jesus. What did Jesus actually teach concerning the kingdom? There's a lot of teaching out there that we are exposed to from day to day, from Sunday to Sunday in our churches. But what did Jesus actually teach? We're going to be looking at that. And uh, there may be some surprises for some of us. Praise the Lord, Jonathan. So good to have you with us here today. And... Uh, let me, um, we're going to have to catch up from your uh, excursion into Alaska, and maybe we can do that a little bit later on today. Let me write a little uh, note right here. Uh, Greetings in Jesus' name. Comment. And ask your question. All right. Well, I typed a little fast, but maybe everybody can understand what's there. It's good to have you with us right up front at the very beginning. We're going to go to God in prayer. And uh, then we're going to see if we can get a brother on the line here that... Uh, will uh, take part in this oral discussion. This is the uh, 26th day of the month. So uh, let me uh, get to our prayer for this particular day. We are praying through uh, our prayer book. Uh, for the Apostolic Orthodox Church International. And on the 26th day of the month, our mid-morning prayer, the, uh, the psalm that we are praying today is the uh, 127th psalm. And uh, so if you want to get your Bibles turned there to join me in this prayer, we start with the Our Father, we end with the Our Father, and uh, we pray a psalm, and also we pray uh, the second paragraph of the Apostolic Creed as our confession. So let me take a sip of my coffee here. And then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. It's storming here in... Uh, southeastern Texas, where I'm located in Texas City. So if you hear some thundering or some crashing, or if we lose power, it's just uh, life in Texas. Amen. So uh, I wanted to give you that heads up. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, today we pray that your kingdom would come in the world. Lord, we look all around us and we see evil running rampant. But we know, Lord, that none of this has taken you by surprise. And we know that there's only a matter of time when the kingdoms of, of this world, the kingdoms of the Antichrist, will become your kingdoms. Father, we pray that that day hasten on. We ask, dear Lord, that you would move in the affairs of men to bring about your will and your purpose in the earth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 127. You will recognize this. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to set up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Praise God. Our confession of faith is the second paragraph of the creed. Who, that's the Father, because of us sinners and for our salvation, became manifested in flesh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. This incarnation, not lessening his deity nor altering his humanity, fully God and fully man, consubstantiated. Therefore, the angel named him Jesus, Yahweh, Savior. As to his deity, he is the same essence, nature, and being as the Father. As to his humanity, he is a like essence, nature, and being with us men. Thereby, and because of generation and redemption, reasonably termed the Son of God. And we end with the Our Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. Glory be to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, one God, world without end. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to the phone right now, and uh, I'm going to make a phone call. Praise the Lord, Brother Brian. Good to have you with us. Uh, I know that you and uh, Brother Jonathan are, are friends, I think. I see you all talking. And I think you have uh, Alaska uh, in common. Uh, so it's good to have both of you here with us. Amen. I'm going to make a phone call to my brother and see if I can't get him on the phone. And, uh, it's early for him. He's out in California, not my natural brother, but my brother in the Lord. And, uh, let me see here. <clears throat> Give me just a second. Let me see if he answers. If he answers, he'll be a good one to have on for uh, our conversation today since we're talking about the kingdom. Mm -hmm. 
it's ringing and uh, when he answers we'll put him on uh, we'll put him on speak well good morning my brother how are you today Uh huh. Are are you are you able to come on live with us today on Bible Talk and talk about the Kingdom of God? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Oh, you you're fine. You're going to be fine. Hang on just a minute, and I'll put you on speaker. Okay, I have you on speaker now. Can you hear me? I hear you fine. All right. Uh, those, this is, uh, something new that we are doing and, uh, we've never done this before on Bible talk. So brother Brian Boyd or brother Jonathan, or anyone that's here, can you tell me if, if you can hear brother Rodney Smith? Okay. Brother Rodney, uh, just praise the Lord there and, uh, with us and tell us where you are and tell us what your life is about right now and uh, give these brethren an opportunity to gauge your modulation. Go ahead. Okay, well, praise the Lord, everyone. My name is Rodney Smith, and uh, <clears throat> I am in San Diego, California. And uh, what I'm mostly working on ministry-wise here is uh, I work with a few different churches. As I'm not a, I'm not a, a bishop or an overseer. But uh, I am an associate pastor and teaching pastor, and um, I work mostly right now in leadership development. Um, and uh, that uh, piece, in my mind, ties into the discipleship piece. So as far as concentrating on developing leaders in the church right now, that is, um, that is similar. And my, my heart is really developing all Christians. So from, from a brand new Christian just recently born again to those who are called and taking the steps to enter the eldership within the church. So the Lord has me focusing on the latter, um, but I do see that as a piece of the whole of discipleship and the work of the kingdom. Amen. Well, praise the Lord and, and welcome today. Brother Scott Hutchinson, welcome to you. Greetings, he says, to the new covenant Israel of God in Jesus name. I see he's already got a good mindset toward our uh, target subject for this week. Uh, Brother Scott, uh, Brother uh, Boyd said that he's having some technical difficulties. Brother Jonathan, I know he's probably at school. He, he, he's a teacher in the public school system, so he's probably just listening in. But I need somebody to let me know if Brother Smith it can be heard because this is our first attempt to uh, bring in someone on the telephone. Uh, so Brother Scott, can you tell me perhaps if you were was able to hear Brother Smith in his greetings just now? And I'll give you a minute to type in that answer because uh, we, uh, okay, Brother Jonathan says we are good here. Even on closed caption, I can read what he is saying. Well, isn't that wonderful? Some of these people are uh, uh, technology geeks. Brother Scott says he can hear him. I'm not, call, I'm not calling my son a geek by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that I don't know how to do all that closed captioning business. But, but, but. Old dogs can learn new tricks. <clears throat> Give me just a little bit of time here. I, I was 50 years old before I knew how to turn on a computer. And my son, Jonathan, who is with us today, Bishop Jonathan Nathaniel Hayes from up in Maine, he, uh, he got on to me and he said, you know, Dad, you got to come into the, to the 21st century. I said, oh, well, I guess... I guess I'll come. Uh, so uh, he built a little fire under me there. All right, all praise to King Jesus, Daniel Joseph Spink. So good to have you with us today, Daniel. Praise God. All right, I, I uh, 
pretty clear uh, my internet isn't keeping up well brother brian boyd says okay uh brother uh smith uh we are uh talking about the kingdom of god uh today and uh, that's sort of our target conversation for the entire week what it means to be in the kingdom what is the kingdom what it means to be the subject of the kingdom. And I thought that we would uh, eventually get to the kingdom chapter of Matthew, which is Matthew chapter 13. And uh, the first, Jesus taught seven parables there <clears throat> on the kingdom. And the first parable is a parable of the sower. Uh, so that's what I want to target today is the parable of the sower. Uh, but before we get there, maybe there could be some preliminary things that we can talk about. You in the chat, if you want to uh, share an idea uh, or some ideas that you have concerning the kingdom of God, what it means to be in the kingdom. Uh, Brother Smith, if you want to, uh, I would like for you to share with us what it means to you, what the kingdom of God, when you think of the kingdom of God, what is it that you think about? And uh, how do you present it when you're teaching and when you're discipling people concerning the kingdom of God? So Brother Smith, could you just jump in there and, and give us some thoughts on kingdom? Absolutely. And once again, thank you, Bishop Jerry, for having me on your Bible chat program. Um, excellent topic. I'm really excited about the parable of the sower. And uh, my introduction to the kingdom of God <clears throat> me, would be that uh, the kingdom of God is a, a way of thinking of the, or it's the biblical nomenclature for the, the rulership of God. It's the dominion of God. Kingdom, in, in, in fact, the word dome that's, that's there uh, on, the, on dominion is also at the end of kingdom. It's the dome of the king, the realm of the king in which he is uh, sovereign and in which he has jurisdiction for the for the for the one true God it is everything in the whole universe and so everyone is under the rulership of God however because there has been rebellion and there is in this temporary uh, present time there is wickedness there is sin there is evil um, all of that will be dealt with at the judgment and there will be no no longer wickedness um so in this time those who are in the kingdom of god has to deal with those who are in submission to god those who submit their lives to god to live for god to follow his ways to be like him to be everything that he has created us to be uh the plants and the animal kingdom follow god instinctively or just uh as a matter of the fact of their existence however we human beings uh many of us are in rebellion of course the scripture teaches we've all been in rebellion but we are called to be reconciled to god and those of us who are members of god's kingdom as you said subjects of god's kingdom we have subjected ourselves to god and given ourselves to him rather than um, exerting our own uh, desires and saying, no, Lord, not thy will, but mine be done. And that is the exact opposite of what we're being taught in Scripture, uh, and following the example of Jesus and telling the Lord uh, and living at, for the Lord as not my will, but your will be done. And then uh, one final thought, when we are um, subjects of the kingdom, the Bible over and over again explains that we are children of the kingdom and we are children of the king. So the kingdom of God is actually a royal family. Um, so we're not merely subjects as if we are um, slaves or we, are, we don't have a personal relationship with our king. Um, it is true that we are God's servants. We are his slaves. We are to be his slaves. We are to be his subjects. But he is our father. He is our father by virtue of creation and by virtue of saving us and um, birthing us again into his kingdom out of the wickedness of this world. So the Bible over and over again calls us the sons of God. And even in this context, as we look at Matthew 13, um, Jesus opens up his discourse on the, the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 
Um, of course, first with, with, with the Beatitudes, but one of them in, chap in verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And we see that term, that phrase over and over again throughout Scripture, Romans 8, 14. And uh, Galatians 3.26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus and uh, and several others. Amen. You know, so one of the things that, well, I, what you said just produced a lot of thoughts <clears throat> as I was listening. And I hope that uh, our people in, in the comment section in the chat, you know, uh, listened as well. And, and may, I would like for you all to engage uh, Elder Smith, uh, Elder Rodney Smith, uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask him, he and I both maybe can respond to them, uh, or maybe you just have a question for him. Now, he said something that was very interesting. Uh, as subjects, we are, we are family. <laughs> we are family, and we call one another brother and sister for that reason. And uh, Brother uh, Smith, also, I, I, if I remember right, you mentioned the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I call the Sermon on the Mount the Kingdom Manifesto. The King gives the Kingdom Manifesto. And uh, there, within that Kingdom Manifesto, he gives what we call the Lord's Prayer, but I call it the Our Father. And we pray it every time that we begin a program, uh, we, we pray the Our Father. And I think of uh, the Our Father. The Our Father is a family prayer, isn't it? I mean, uh, the word our and us. Uh, it's not a prayer of an individual. <clears throat> it is a prayer for the corporate body. Our Father, which art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and and lead us not in, uh, don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the Our Father is a family prayer and uh, it is to be prayed in a corporate setting or even when we pray it privately, we should have the mindset that we're not alone in this prayer. For Christians all over the world are praying the same prayer, and I'm sure someone is praying it at the same time that you are praying it. So when we think about the kingdom, Brother Rodney mentioned the dome, King Dome, uh, the 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 sphere of God's uh, authority of His rule, and we who are inside that, we uh, right, we are family. We are we are members one of another. Would you want to elaborate on that any at all, Elder? Uh, sure. And another word that I didn't think of for, for you know, the, do the dome of the king, the, to translate that Latin word dome, would be the word domain. It, uh, it comes over into English as the word domain, the domain of the king. Um, so that's uh, very good. I love the collective that you pointed out, the um, collective nature of the Lord's Prayer. And uh, that reminds me of the collective nature of the kingdom of God. Um, indeed, the whole of scripture, the theme of all scripture is the kingdom of God. It is about God and his kingdom. It is not about us or any individual. It's uh, the wrong mindset, I would, I would, I would um, argue, to um, think very individualistically that all of the Bible is for me, all of God's kingdom is for me, everything is about me, 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 me. Um, the Lord saves individuals, but he saves us into a family. So all of scripture is collectivist. And including the cultures back then and the ancient uh, Jewish, uh, the different epochs of the ancient, of ancient Israel um, was a, even a collectivist culture, a collectivist society. Um, and uh, um, it, it, the other, the other um, 
big error that we really need to stay, I really need to caution everyone away from is looking at the scripture anthropocentrically rather than theocentrically. Um, let me explain those terms. Yeah, I was going to ask second. you if you could just explain what you mean by anthropocentrically and theocentrically. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to give the terms because they are technical uh, theological terms so that it emphasizes that we are, uh, this has to do with the science and the, um, mostly, mostly the science and the conversation about how we view scripture. Um, what is the Bible all about? What is the Bible? And so um, an anthropocentric view of scripture would be from the Greek anthropos, which just simply means man or mankind, the, the generic word for man. And of course, centric, we can tell that that means center. So anthropocentric, we can say it this way. We don't want to look at scripture as being man-centered. It's centered and focused on humans as its focal point. But we want to look at all the scripture, whether it's prophecy, narrative, the gospel, uh, the Psalms, prayer, as being theocentric. They, from from uh, the, the first part there, from theos in the Greek, which is the Greek word for God. So God-centered. And so this is simply that the long uh, theological way of saying, uh, those two terms anyway, of saying the Bible is all about God, that we that it is centered on God. And so when we join the kingdom of God, it's not about, OK, I've got in. Um, I've got everything um, that, that God has for me. Where's or, or, or I've got into the kingdom. Where's my reward? Where's this? Where's this? It's all a checklist of like you can do it. It's all about us. Get everything you can. Um, there is the individual aspect of salvation. Individuals are saved into the kingdom. But my point here is that the emphasis of the kingdom of God and the emphasis of scripture is us joining God's team, us being on God's side, because God's kingdom and God's dominion does not waver. It is the constant. And we only waver if we rebel to it. So we are called in scripture. Uh, the focus of scripture is that we are called to get on God's side, that we are called to enter into the kingdom of God. Um, and, um, it is about what God is doing and who God is and what God is accomplishing in the world. Amen. Thank you. That's good. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's real good. Uh, again, I want to encourage, you know, the people in the chat to, uh, jump in here and to participate. We will read your comment in real time if you have a question we'll ask your question in real time uh last uh, friday uh, we had uh wow we had over 90 comments in the comment section <clears throat> and uh, we've been having anywhere from 600 to a thousand people a day that uh view uh bible talk so uh we have uh acquired you know, an astonishing success, having only been on for two weeks. This is our 11th episode here today, and I'm really excited uh, about it. Uh, I had a friend ask me, an Anglican priest, he asked me uh, a few days ago, matter of fact, uh, he's going, supposed to be on on Thursday, like we're having uh, Elder Rodney Smith on with us today. We'll be having uh, uh, Father Stoltz with us on Thursday, and we're going to be talking to him a little bit <clears throat> and get uh, the Anglican view on the kingdom of God. And uh, I thought that might be interesting. <clears throat> but he said to me, he said, well, wh why are you having it for two hours? Two hours, isn't that a long time? You know, their sermon, you know, their sermons aren't aren't that long usually, and uh, but uh, he's a good friend of mine, and I think that uh, you will enjoy hearing him. I said, well, you know, I I want to be on. Uh, I want to dominate the morning. I want to dominate the weekday morning <laughs> for those uh, that would listen and uh, and watch. <clears throat> so that's what we're here. 
uh, attempting to do. We're talking about the kingdom of God, and we're talking with Elder Rodney Smith from San Diego, California. It's early, early in the morning there, and he's so gracious to have joined us, and he's already said some wonderful things. Now, we're going to get to Matthew chapter 13, but before that, I, I do, I want to say something, uh, Brother Smith, about Matthew and about Matthew in general. Every one, or I should say all four of the gospel evangelists had a purpose uh, for writing their gospel. Matthew's purpose was to demonstrate in no uncertain terms that Jesus was the king of Israel, that Jesus was the son of David. And uh, we call Matthew uh, the kingdom gospel and chapter 13 in particular, the kingdom chapter, because there in chapter 13, uh, Matthew gives, he records seven different parables of Jesus. And hopefully we will look at all of them this week. <clears throat> seven different parables of Jesus on the kingdom where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is likened to, the kingdom of heaven is likened to, the kingdom of heaven is likened to. Now, when we go back to Matthew chapter one, and we look at the genealogy of Jesus, you know, those scriptures that we all just skip over, uh, those scriptures that we don't really pay a whole lot of, of attention to, we just write, get right to the birth narrative, uh, now, that's a mistake, because in giving the genealogy of Jesus, there is some wonderful truths and some wonderful information that is there. And we'll talk about that one day. But what I want to point out now is in, I think it's in verse 15, uh, Matthew records that there are 14 generations from this person to this person and 14 generations from this person to this person and another 14 generations from this person to Jesus. So Matthew divides the genealogy, genealogy of Jesus into, four, uh, uh, into three groups of 14, except... <clears throat> If you look in the Old Testament at the genealogy, say of Abraham and of David and, and so on, it's not that neatly, it, it can't be that neatly divided. In other words, for Matthew to get his 14 generations, three groups of 14, he had to skip over some generations. And that's okay. Because in giving a genealogy, you don't have to give every generation. You can throw a grandson in there as a son or even a great-grandson as a son. So since Matthew did this, then we know that there was a very particular reason why he did. So then a fair question would be, why does Matthew divide the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham to Jesus into three sets of 14 generations? And I think the reason is, is because the number 14 is the number of the name David. You see, the Hebrew language like the Greek, did not have separate silo, uh, symbols for numbers. They used letters for numbers. So then each person's name had a numerical value. Each word had a numerical value. If you add the numerical value of the name David you get the number 14. 
And, uh, you know, Hebrew was written without any vowels because there are no vowel letters in Hebrew. There are only vowel points. If you look at a Hebrew word, you'll see the Hebrew letters. Those are all consonants. And underneath each consonant are little points. Those are vowel points. That's how you know what vowel to put with uh, that consonant. So the letters of David's name is a delet, a vowel, and a delet. Or in English, it would be a D, a V, and a D. And each one of those letters have a numerical value. They add up to the number 14. So when Matthew, I think, when Matthew uh, was giving his genealogy, he took the genealogy and divided it into three sets of 14 to let us know that uh, this is the uh, number of the name David. And he is saying the person that I am introducing here, which is Jesus, the Messiah, is the son of David. As the son of David, then, he is the proper king of of Israel. So Matthew comes right out of the gate declaring Jesus to be the descendant of David, the son of David, therefore the king of Israel. Matthew's gospel is the kingdom gospel. Amen. Having said that, I want to pause here right before we go to Matthew chapter 13. And, uh, well, first, let me ask you, uh, uh, Elder Smith, do you have anything to add to what I just said about that uh, process of gematria? Uh, some say gematria, uh, the science of turning numbers into names and names into numbers. <clears throat> well, thank you, Bishop. Just briefly about um, Matthew's gospel and the opening of it. And um, before I do that, I wanted to, um, I, I think I kind of left my last uh, long comment hanging. So um, I, I wanted to make one quick comment. Why did I say that about being, you know, the scripture being God centered? What, uh, the practical side of that we can see as we open up any book of the Bible, including Matthew, is that we see the stories of what either good people, uh, people who are doing good, who are following God or people who are doing evil. And we can focus in on the stories uh, of those individuals. Rather, we should be seeing behind the stories and the overall story of what is God doing in this instance. And indeed, what we see in the gospel in the New Testament, um, God is sending the Messiah into the world. He is incarnating and coming into the world. And so the, you know, the little themes we see, of course, in the life of Joseph, we see um, later on in chapter one that it opens up with with um, uh, the, the birth narrative. And then it mentions Joseph and, uh, and, and, and his, his dream um, to go ahead and take. Mary as his wife, um, we're also asleep. and um, and so those are details of the story. But the overall story is this is what God is doing, not necessarily what Joseph or David or anyone else is doing. And so Matthew is making the connection with what God is doing all throughout history, and especially with the kingdom of Israel, which is God's chosen kingdom that he established is the human kingdom of God that he established as an extension or the earthly representative or earthly version of his uh, overall kingdom. I don't just want to say celestial kingdom, but the Lord's kingdom encompass, encompasses all of the universe, both uh, the, the uh, spiritual realm and the physical realm. And of course, yeah, Matthew opens up. I don't know much about the uh, the, the the numbering um, and uh, the gematria. I am not also a mathematician. I shy away from numbers, <laughs> but I do. Uh, it's what's clear to me is that I I, I can see that um, uh, Matthew obviously sees a pattern here, and the pattern that he sees centers around King David. He uses those three. Um, those three figures or those three time frames uh, the in in the old testament in the time prior to christ abraham king david and then uh the captivity in babylon and david is at the center of that but um my uh 
my uh, most obvious observation that I have is the way that Matthew opens his gospel. Just verse verse one, Matthew one one, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That is a way, a first century Jewish way of introducing Jesus as the king by calling the king of Israel, by calling him the son of David. You're, he's calling him the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. And by calling him the son of Dave, son of Abraham, he is calling him um, the, an Israelite. Um, so this very um, introduction to the book, just the first statement or the first verse introduces Jesus as the king, as the rightful king, as you said. Well, that's true. Let me ask you one, one other question <clears throat> before we sort of change gears here. Do you see a difference between the New Testament term kingdom of heaven, which Matthew uses, and kingdom of God, which the other gospel writers use uh, mostly? Uh, what do you think about those two terms? Are they synonymous? Are, are the gospel writers intending to uh, emphasize different things with those two terms, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God? No, I see them as two synonymous terms, um, the kingdom of heaven being most, most common in the gospel of Matthew. And so I see kingdom of heaven um, as a sort of a circumlocution for kingdom of God. We know that in the New Testament, we see that the New Testament authors do honor that Jewish tradition of respecting the name of Yahweh and not saying his name. The name of Yahweh doesn't occur at all in the New Testament, but it occurs in the Old Testament um, many times. And so that tradition is well established by that time, and they're referring to God and the Lord rather than Yahweh. In fact, even quoting Old Testament Yahweh passages as the Lord. Um, um, Kurios in the Greek, uh, which would be uh, translated Lord. And that's what occurs in the New Testament. So I think we see in Matthew's gospel compared to some of the others, we see maybe the beginnings of the other tradition of even having a circumlocution for, the, for God and Lord, in fact, today it has expanded and it has gone a lot farther in that uh, many Orthodox Jewish uh, sects and uh, adherents will not even say God or Lord and not even want to write the whole word. They'll use dashes in place of vowels. And, and, and that is all uh, has grown out of the, um, the tradition of not using the name Yahweh out of respect and reverence and also perhaps out of um, an abundance of precaution to not use his name um, in a flippant manner or in a vain manner. So I see them as synonymous terms, and that's sort of why I, uh, the, the, a little bit of the explanation of what I see is probably the rationale of using the, both of those terms and why Kingdom of Heaven was probably catching on around that time. Matthew uses kingdom of heaven almost exclusively, whereas the other gospel writers uh, seem to not flinch from using the term kingdom of God. Now, this has caused some, and I want to uh, caution our viewers to uh, be, be, be cautious when people want to make... Uh, uh, a distinction in theology when it comes to the terms kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. Usually these people have an agenda that's, that's not good. They're wanting to push some, some uh, uh, teaching that is really not you know, central to Holy Scripture. And they seize upon these two terms kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God to do it. I'm in agreement 100% with uh, Elder Rodney Smith here. Uh, they're synonymous terms, and it is only the preference of the writer that determines whether kingdom of heaven 
our kingdom of God are used. So if we uh, have Matthew, who uses uh, almost only the kingdom of heaven, then there's a, you know, it's a fair question to ask why. <clears throat> and why did the other writers use kingdom of, of God? Well, look at the audience to which Matthew wrote and the audiences of Mark and Luke and John. Matthew wrote exclusively to a Jewish audience. Matthew wrote uh, in, a, in a time when uh, Christianity was still attempting to evangelize Judaism. And most all of the Christians were coming out of Judaism. <clears throat> but Mark, you know, uh, wrote later. Some say that he wrote first. I don't think so. I think that's a mistake. I think that Mark, and, and not only did he write later, in my opinion, but, but he wrote to a different audience. He wrote to a Gentile audience. Luke was not even a Jew. Luke was a Gentile. And John, John wrote for a universal audience. Matthew wrote, he targeted the Jews. And it was uh, offensive to them to call the name God or even use the word Lord, as uh, uh, Brother uh, Smith has just said. So Matthew seems to be sidestepping that offense by using the word heaven instead of God. So he's being a, a little bit here, he's being a little politically correct to keep from offending those to whom he's writing because it was important to him that they hear what he had to say. Now, you and I, as teachers and as ministers of the gospel, we might take a page from Matthew's playbook here. And if we are speaking to people in our congregations or wherever we might be, we might uh, attempt to have some sensibility, uh, sensitivity, I should say, concerning the things uh, ways of speaking that are uh, that are uh, uh, acceptable to them and ways that might cause them to close an ear to what we're having to say. I think Matthew was keenly aware of that, and that's why he uses kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God, when in fact they are synonymous terms, and, and we can prove that. And before I came on the air, uh, this morning, I spent about 30 minutes just going through the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God passages in Matthew and Mark and in Luke, and you see where they are interchangeable, where the writers are recording the same, the same teaching of Jesus, uh, different terms are used, kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. <clears throat> Amen. Okay, having said that, and hopefully that will be helpful, you know, and hopefully it will head off <clears throat> some false teaching that somebody might want to bring your way concerning the kingdom. Uh, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 13, but before we do, I want to uh, insert a little commercial here. I, I would like for you to remember uh, Disciples of the Way, which is what is bringing you uh, Bible talk. And uh, we are asking the Lord for 100 people that will come along beside us as monthly encouragers, monthly supporters uh, financially, so that we can continue this work, so that we can publish other work. And uh, I, if the Lord is Dealing with, if, if this ministry ministers to you, we would like for you to pray about including us in your monthly giving. I know you give to your church, and that's first and foremost. 
and uh, you you must take care of your your preacher. You must take care of your church. But uh, your your extra giving in the kingdom of the Lord. Uh, please consider the apostolic disciples of the way, and uh, in your uh, giving, and definitely in your prayers. Remember our books on Amazon Books. You can go there and just uh, up in the banner, search search my name, Bishop Jerry Hayes. My bookshelf would come up, and we would appreciate it if you would you would have our book, my books, on your library shelf, populating your your library. On and and I've written on various topics. And I'm sure if you just peruse my bookshelf, you'll find something that will bless you. And your purchase of that book will bless this ministry. God bless you for considering that. Amen. Now we're going to Matthew chapter 13. And just let me begin that chapter. And Brother Smith, uh, I don't know how long that you can stay with us today. But if you have to go, I would def we would definitely understand that. But we would appreciate you staying with us as long as you can. Uh, Matthew chapter 13. We are looking there. <clears throat> the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Now, the scene here is uh, there's a multitude on the beach, and uh, Jesus went, uh, got into a boat and pushed out a little bit from the shore and began to teach the multitude that is on the beach. Now this morning when I looked at this and I asked the Lord, I said, what is the significance of this? Is there a spiritual message? Is, is there a cryptic lesson concerning Jesus getting in the boat and teaching from the boat instead of standing on the beach? You say, well, Bishop Hayes, does everything in the Bible, every line, every sentence have to have a hidden meaning? No, it doesn't have to, but I sort of think it does. <laughs> and I, I always look for it. And I always say, you know, if, if something is, is stated that is a little bit obvious, that the story could have been told without it, I'm always asking the question, why is that? Why is that? I asked that question about the folded napkin, about Jesus' face uh, on resurrection morning. And why did the Bible mention that the napkin was folded into a place by itself apart from the grave clothes? And because that troubled me and puzzled me for years, the Lord finally gave me the answer to that and the message that i preached years <laughs> decades ago has circled the globe many times over now and i entitled it the folded napkin a promise of a return i'm not yet finished i'm not yet through i'm coming but things like that just 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 puzzle me and uh causes me to it's the inquiring mind, things that make you go, hmm, things that make you say, well, why is that? There? Why is it there? <laughs> why is it there that Jesus got in the boat and taught from the water? If you know, share with us, because I asked the Lord that this morning and I haven't gotten an answer yet. And maybe there is no answer. Maybe he just did it because it was convenient. I don't know. But I happen to think that nothing is by happenstance in the word of God. All right. He went out and he began to teach. 
and verse 3, and he spake many things unto them in parables. Now, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read the parable. And uh, then verse 10, it really gets interesting. Interesting. And then Jesus uses the rest of the chapter to explain the parable. And I'm anxious to hear what you in the chat have to say about the parable. Bro Brother Fred is with us. Brother Fred says, two of my favorite people talking. Well, <laughs> God bless you, Brother Fred. I know you love Brother Rodney. And I hope you love me as well. I think you do. I feel your love a lot. Amen. One of our favorite people. He's one of our favorite people. You're right, Brother Rodney. One of our Bishop, most. May I, may I weigh in on that first uh, section there? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Okay, just briefly. Um, and uh, I think that uh, a lot of details are included in Scripture as incidental details. And they give us the characteristic of historical fact that this is a historical event and, and a lot of these um, um, a lot of these details they're not they're not meaningless even if they don't have um, a, a cryptic meaning as you said because they serve to give the scripture especially the narratives the quality first of all of historicity and secondly, a lot of times these are the things that historians can go back and verify. Does this fit the first century context? Does it does the setting work with the era in, in, in which this story is set? Um, there are, uh, you know, fishing was a big trade. His disciples were fishermen. Um, there were the Sea of Galilee is a real place. There were boats on the sea and you know, a place for multitudes to gather in a particular area. Um, so what would that look like? And then some of them can be directly verified as fact, if there are, as fact, if there are um, historical records outside of scripture that survive and corroborate it, that's not always needed in every instance, but when they, when we do have them and we have several, um, they are helpful in proving and showing that the, that, the, you know, what we're reading here is, historical account of Jesus and not uh, fiction. Amen. When you say that, I, I think of uh, the gospel account of the healing at the pool of Bethesda. And I think it was John said, there is by the sheep gate a pool. Uh, and uh, that, that's a historical account. And many people say that the gospel of John was written uh, maybe even in the second century. But because John said there is by the sheep gate a pool, we know that he didn't say there was by the sheep gate a pool. He said there is by the sheep gate a pool. That he wrote uh, when the pool was still there. And uh, he had intimate knowledge of Jeruz of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, if it was so forth and so on. So you're right. It, it could just be just a historical, adding a, a historical flavor to it. Thank you. It's always good to get uh, these different perspectives. Amen. Now we're going to uh, verse three. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. Brother Jonathan uh, wrote, before we get into exegeting this, 
Uh, Brother Jonathan wrote, while I agree with what he said about the historicity of the narrative, I believe God is grand enough to do both simultaneously. Amen. That's good. Amen. And then Brother Boyd said, uh, I have heard it preached that the folded napkin was an indication of a finished work, and it came from his being raised by a carpenter. I don't know myself. I'm just a student. <laughs> Amen. I don't want to uh, really get off on the folded napkin since we're talking about the kingdom parables here. But uh, the folded napkin, if, if an individual was uh, dining and uh, the, uh, the napkin that one uses uh, at, a, at an eating event, if the, if the uh, wait staff, and this is true today, it's been true since time of antiquity and until today. Uh, if the wait staff sees the napkin just wadded up, used wadded up and laying in your place, they know that you're finished. They know that you're not coming back if you leave the table. So they'll clean the, you know, they'll, they'll clean your setting up. But if your napkin is folded and laying off to one side of your of your plate, then they know you're not finished and you are coming back. So really, it seems that right the opposite is true, Brother Brian, uh, that the folded napkin gave the promise of an unfinished work. And I'm not through. I'm not finished. I'm returning. And that's what Peter found. When he ran into the in, into the tomb, John outran Peter to the tomb, but Peter ran deeper and further than John because John stopped outside. Peter ran inside. Peter found the folded napkin that gave a promise of uh, of his work that was yet to, to be accomplished, which was the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the establishing of the church, so forth and so on. So uh, that that's the message that God, you know, uh, gave me. And uh, I've preached it for 40 years or better. And uh, amen, I it, it's born much, much fruit in the kingdom of God. But that's just the way the word of God spoke to me concerning that. Okay, let me get back now here to this parable of the sower. And uh, one thing I would point out here, and then we're going to get into verses uh, 10 and 11. But before we get into verses 10 and 11, uh, I want to point out that this is not a planter. And Brother Rodney, you may have something to say about this. This is not a planter. This is a sower. And uh, those of us who have grown uh, gardens or we have worked on farms, we know the difference in planting and sowing. Planting. You lay out a roll and you plant the roll. In sowing, you broadcast the seed. You just reach into your bag, pull out a handful and just fling it. And that's how that the seed falls on all different kinds of ground. Brother Rodney, you want to make any comment about that part of it? Um, no, I don't. I don't have any comment as far as the distinction uh, between the sower and planter. Just uh, it's obvious that um, this is starting with seed, um, and so when we get into the parable, we'll we'll see what Jesus is talking about and what what the seed represents and what is the uh, kingdom message that the Lord is is teaching through this. Right. Amen. All right, then we, we have the parable. Jesus has taught the parable. Now, his disciples appear to be a little bit concerned about parables in general. 
So verse 10, and the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? And then Jesus had an answer. And we need to pay attention to this answer. This answer is, is at once refreshing and troubling. This answer is refreshing and troubling. But if we're going to deal with the parables of Christ, We've got to deal with these two phases of the parable. So listen to what Jesus said. Because, now he could have just said because. You know, we ask parents, why this, why that? Just because. Because I said so, or because that's the way I want to do it. No, Jesus gives, says because, but then he gives the cause. Because it is given unto you, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that that he hath. Now, verse 11 is pretty clear. Verse uh, verse 12 may need some ferreting out. Verse 11, verse 10, Jesus is asked, why do you teach in parables? Verse 11, Jesus says, because it's for you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but for them, it's not for them to know. Uh, but for them, it's not given. For them, the revelation of the mysteries is not given. So what Jesus is saying here, if you are a member of the initiated, if you are my disciple, then I teach in parables because I'm going to tell you what they mean. But for them... They will hear, but they'll not understand because it is not meant for them to know. It's not meant for them to understand. He said in verse 13, therefore speak I unto them in parables because they seeing see not and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their eyes are dull of hearing, uh, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Least at any time they should uh, see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now, on one hand, it seems that Jesus is on purpose concealing the truth from the Jews. But on the other hand, it seems that they have done it to themselves because they have willingly closed their eyes. They have willingly stopped their ears. But just perchance, some of them would hear and some of them would see. Then Jesus is teaching in parables. So a parable has two purposes to conceal the truth from the uninitiated and to reveal the truth to the initiated. Brother Rodney, would you have any comments on that? Yes, sir. That was, that was good. Um, let me see here. Uh, these verses, where are you at? It's uh, <clears throat> verse, verse 11. Yeah, verse 11, I think, sheds light. Um, well, actually, 
it ties into at least verses one and two that we talked about earlier, because we see Jesus is teaching the multitude. So this is the crowd of people, not necessarily saying that he's teaching his disciples or those who believe in him. It's good. It's a mixed crowd. It's just a, the common population. And so um, we see that Jesus reveals that his tactic was to preach the truth to them in a way that was understandable if you really want it. And if you and if you're going to be complacent um, or apathetic or even just lazy, um, then you're you might not under you might miss it because of that reason. Um, Proverbs, what is it? Let me check. Twenty five two says, "It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search to out search a it out to search it and out." So, yeah. Second Timothy 2.15 says to be diligent uh, in the King James. It says study to show yourself approved. And that word uh, study is translated diligent or diligence. Be diligent in uh, the new King James. And so there's this, um, you know, Peter writes, give all diligence to make your calling and election sure. There's um, this sense of responsibility. And as we expand expound on this parable itself we're going to see that <clears throat> the main lesson that the lord is teaching is fruitfulness to be fruitful in this life um and bear fruit unto god and the fruit represents our labors the work of our life what we do what we actually produce um as living breathing functioning human beings so uh when it comes to spiritual things there is a responsibility that we have to seek God and to seek the truth and then to give as another kingdom parable states give all that we have or sell all that we have in order to obtain that one thing because we recognize it as the most precious so those who are not um, seeking with all of their heart are they really worthy of the truths and the mysteries and even the rewards of the kingdom of God as Jesus said in another place, whoever puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not worthy of him. And then finally, Second Corinthians, um, I mean, First Corinthians 2, I was thinking of number 2. First Corinthians 2 comes to mind in verse 14. Um, but let me see, verse 13, it starts off, uh, it comes to mind, this uh, conversation about the spiritual things concerning the kingdom and why some understand and some don't. Uh, verse 13, we, uh, these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches. Right? That's what people usually gravitate toward. Uh, what's in it for me? How do I get ahead of life? But which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparting spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, um, nor indeed uh, I'm sorry, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And then he ends the chapter. I'll just skip down to the very last uh, sentence of verse 16. But we have the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are living in the kingdom of God, we are conform. We That's a good word. We are to conform ourselves to the kingdom of God, which means to conform ourselves to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we begin to think like he thinks. We do the things that he does. We produce fruit the way his life produced fruit. And um, that is how we immerse ourselves in the spirit and we can discern and actually, okay, we can discern and understand spiritual things because we care about them. Our affection um, and our attention is on those spiritual things and wanting to know them. And then the reverse becomes true. The natural things, the worldly wisdom, the man, human wisdom becomes the foolish things when we see how it pales in comparison to the wisdom and the word and the truths and mysteries of Almighty God. Amen. Jesus taught in parables a lot. And I, th I thank you, Elder, that that was well said and uh, said better than I could have said, said it. And you are adding such a rich dimension to Bible talk. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, in John's Gospel, uh, and this is on parables again, in John's Gospel, chapter 16, and in verse 25, Jesus says this. He said, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, or parables. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, or parables, 
but I shall show you plainly of the Father. In this particular text, in, in John chapter 16 and verse 25, Jesus is stating that up until this point, he had only been speaking of his relationship with the Father in parables. But there was coming a time when he would speak to them plainly of the Father. We've got to keep this parable. Praise the Lord, Brother Jordan. God bless you for being with us today. We've got to keep this parable aspect of Jesus' teaching uh, method in mind. When we read the parables or when we read Jesus' comments concerning his relationship with heaven, praise the Lord, Sister Lisa, uh, or his relationship uh, with, with the Father. Because the reason that Jesus taught in parables was to conceal and also reveal. To conceal from those, as uh, Brother Rodney has, has illustrated, from those who are just half-stepping, for those who are not sincere, for those who are just not really sold out, for those who are in the mixed multitude. They're not really true followers of Christ. Um, the truth's going to be concealed from them. Now, that might sound harsh, but that is the way that Christ does it. The truth he conceals from them. He lets them hear it, but they don't hear it. He lets them hear the words, but they don't have the interpretation of the words because he is speaking in parables. He does it here in the kingdom teachings, and he particularly does it in the Godhead teachings, where he is talking about his relationship with Father God. Let me read you something, and then we're going to get right back to where we are. But I, I just want to read this to you so that you can feel the weight of <clears throat> excuse me, the weight of the parable method of Jesus' teaching. Jesus says in chapter 16 and in verse 13, uh, uh, verse 12, chapter 16 and verse 12, he said, this is in John now, we, we're really in Matthew, but I've just made a I went off on a little rabbit trail, but I'll come right back, Brother Rodney. I haven't forgot you over there. I'll, I'll get right back to you. He says, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth is come. Now, the pluralists love to bring this scripture up to us and demand that we exegete it in isolation. They demand that we exegete this scripture without its context, in isolation, and they know that it will present the oneness theology a problem if they're able to force us to attempt to exegete it in isolation. But no scriptures of any private interpretation. The sum of thy word, O God, is truth. All of it taken together. So here's what Jesus says. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. 
All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. They say exegete that. And they want us to exegete it as though it were not a parable. But we cannot exegete it as though it were not a parable. Brother Jordan says it's transmodalistic language. I've never heard that term, Brother Jordan, but I like it. And I think I know where you're going with it. But the fact is, it's a parable. And it must be understood as a parable. And it must be interpreted as a parable. And it's transmodalistic language, as Brother Jordan said. But if you try to interpret it in a wooden, literal sense, in a wooden, literal sense, it can't be understood in harmony with the rest of Scripture. It can't be because it, it, you have plural persons here if you interpret it in a wooden literal sense. But because it is a parable, it moves it out of the genre of a literally interpretable text. Now, Jesus taught this way just so that those who are not truly his children will be confused, misled. They will misunderstand. This, this parable thing is a filter. I'm going to say something very harsh here. I'm a farm boy. I was raised on, on a subsistence farm until I was 17. Then I moved to the city with my parents, but my grandmother and my aunt raised me. I milked two cows every morning, every afternoon, or every evening, you know, after school. That was my job, milking the cows, feeding the livestock, and we raised our own animals, sold them, and uh, milked, and... Uh, one of the things that we did with the milk, because when you'd go to the barn and you would milk the cow, inev inevitably trash would get into the milk pail. So once I took it to the house, I went up on the back porch, and the very first thing I did is I took a, what they used to call back then a cheese cloth. It's a straining cloth, a cloth used for straining. And then I would take the milk and pour it through that cheesecloth and strain out all the trash, the twigs, the pieces of hay that may have fallen into uh, the milk pail. Well, what the parables are, beloved, they are the cheesecloth. They are the strainer to catch the trash. Only those filled with the Holy Ghost, only those truly born again, only those that are truly initiated will get through the strainer. Everything else gets caught in the strainer. So these churches, these people, these teachers that cannot see that Jesus is the mighty God in flesh, the people who cannot see Acts 2.38 as the plan of salvation, the people who cannot see Sunday as the proper day of worship, the people who cannot, and I'm just going right down the line, cannot see that holiness is a way of Christian life, people who cannot see that Jesus is physically coming the second time. Well, it's on purpose. It's on purpose that they can't see it. They read the same scriptures that you and I read, but on purpose, God has caught them in the strainer. 
least they should see, least they should hear and be saved. But God has an elect that he has known from the very beginning of time whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundation of the world. All others get caught in the strainer. Wow. We'll talk about that later. Now, Brother Rodney, I'm back with you. I have not forgotten you, but now we're going to go into uh, the, uh, the explanation that Jesus gives of the parable. Brother Rodney, are you still with me? Have I lost you? Uh, yes, sir. I'm still here. I was wondering if I could uh, briefly share something about the nature of parables where you landed there. Absolutely. That's what you're here for. Okay. A big amen to that. Um, and uh, when we think about, there's an eschatological aspect to these parables, because when we think about eschatology, we, you know, we want to think about the, which means the doctrine of the last things, as you well know, um, and, and most of your audience, I'm sure, does. Um, we we like to think about the return of Christ, the second coming, uh, and yet it's important to keep in mind that there is an ex, uh, an eschatological aspect to the Gospels themselves. Um, Jesus, uh, the coming of Jesus marks the beginning of the end of this age, um, and the and the beginning of the judgment. And indeed, there is a judgment that takes place with the coming of Christ. And when he starts to preach, he begins preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, so he's preaching the judgment. And, and, and we see also, uh, for example, Paul in Acts 17 preaching that uh, the day of judgment has been um, appointed. It's appointed. And Jesus is the judge. And so First Peter 4, 17 tells us, you know, for the time has come that judgment begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first. What will the end of those who do not? What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And this is with reference to the church that even right now the judgment begins with us in a preliminary way that we can go ahead and judge ourselves. The scripture says, I think it. it you can correct me. I, I, I might be. I, I'm thinking it's James or um, tell me who says that uh, um, if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Um, it, it might even be in the same passage here. But um, yeah, so there is, as you were pointing out, this um, concealing nature of these parables, yet revealing at the same time, there is an as there is a judgment aspect to that, and, and, and that the judgment is already beginning to weed out those who are not serious, who do not really care and will not. I love the farm um, example uh, analogy to. To, to work on the farm a lot of people today don't really know what life uh what hard work life is supposed to be you know at least in our western culture and the postmodern time but i tell my children all the time life is work uh, it's about being productive and being active and and seeking out the will of god and, and what we're supposed to do and doing it to the best of our ability and getting even continuously getting better improving every time that we do something and so the kingdom of God is no different. We are all called at, to be in the kingdom of God. It's not a place of just uh, of seating. It's not a uh, it's not an auditorium where we take our seats. No, it is a place of work. It is the Lord's field. It is the Lord's building that we are the construction workers and we are involved in continuing the work that Jesus began to build the kingdom of God here in this time. It is the Lord's field where we continue to sow and to water, and to and to prune, and to harvest, and to till the ground, um, and, and and so that aspect is one. You know, do we really care about the things of the kingdom of God? Well, that's going to be shown through our actions, through our fruit, as this parable and a lot of other places in Scripture refer to the results of our actions, the results of our life um, as fruit. So that's what I wanted to share about that judgment aspect uh, to the to the concealing, simultaneous concealing and revealing um, in these parables. Amen. That's good. Amen. Uh, Brother Jordan, uh, in in the chat, I I thought I saw you post again, and you said you just made that transmodalistic language. You made that phrase, uh, brother. Let me find out that you are a wordsmith. Praise God. 
we need yeah, that, yeah i wanted to say that such, that is his that is george uh, pastor jordan's uh one of his latest phrases <laughs> i recognize that right away it's moralistic language i love it i just absolutely love it praise god all right uh we're on to verse 18 now brother rodney verse 18 of matthew chapter 13 hear ye therefore the parable of the sower now jesus didn't often explain his parables did he brother rodney he didn't often i'm sorry well, he didn't he, I, I said he, he didn't always explain his parables that's right yeah he doesn't always explain right. but so whenever he does that's a special treat and he explains this parable he says when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom now the word of the kingdom what is that brother rodney the word of the kingdom yeah um the word represents the well, it tells us really the word of the kingdom so um word here is going to be um representative of not just a particular word like when a a, a, a guest speaker comes to a church and says, I have a word for you for this congregation, or somebody even comes up to you and says, Hey, you know what? I've got a word for you. Um, or we might ask uh, one of our friends or um, a group of, of, of our colleagues or friends, Hey, what's the word? We're not asking for one single word, you know, like the word word <laughs> or uh, any particular one single solitary word. But word here represents a message. It means a message, the message of the kingdom. So that would be the message that the kingdom of God has come. And there is a calling for us to repent and believe in the gospel as Jesus and oh, there it is. And sent the apostles out to preach. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be the gospel? Yeah, it would be the So, and then I, I said all that to say this, that when it says the word, um, Jesus elaborates right there he says the word of the kingdom and just as kingdom of god and kingdom of heaven are synonymous the word of the kingdom is the same as saying the is synonymous with saying the word of the message of the gospel so yeah the god it's it's the gospel is of course about jesus christ but the gospel is also called the gospel of the kingdom Amen. because it's the news the message that the kingdom of god has come and it's here now first in the person of jesus christ and also through us his church wait a minute you said the kingdom of god has come now you mean we're not looking for the kingdom of god to come in the future it's already here well that's a good um that's a good question i wish that noise would stop please stop um sounds like you're filling your car up with gas or something no i just i just uh moved my car to a different location okay. well i'm in the process i'm almost done but um what was it? oh yeah so there is um in in uh new testament scholarship I, what i mentioned earlier about the eschatological um features of the gospel and uh the first coming of christ including the parables that we're examining this week um there is this phrase that refers to the eschatological aspect of of the first coming of Christ and even the modern time, the current time uh, that we're in now. And that is um, the kingdom of God is already but not yet. So there is a um, coming of the kingdom of God in the first. In fact, the Old Testament is about the kingdom of God as well. And God is working out the kingdom and he's doing a particular thing in the Old Testament. And now in the new covenant, he's doing a new thing. And he shows up himself as the king who has finally come. The king came to this earth 2,000 years ago. And so in that sense, the kingdom is already here. But yet there is still an ultimate aspect in which I mentioned probably at the top of the program that the wickedness, the evil um, and, and the sin that we're all called to reject right now. We're given the opportunity to judge ourselves so that we won't be judged and given the opportunity to, to reject rebellion and submit ourselves to God and be his children. That evil has not been eliminated yet, but we're still looking forward to a time in which the kingdom will fully present, be presented. 
and Christ will return to this earth and all wickedness will cease, all <coughs> sin will cease, yeah. and there will be a final judgment. So yeah. we, we say the kingdom will be consummated at that time. Yeah, that's correct. And But yet it, it will be consummated at that time, yet the kingdom of God has already been inaugurated with the first coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. And consummated at his second coming. Amen. Amen. All right. And when, uh, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and uh, right, that, that's just, uh, uh, Brother Rodney, one of your words here, we're talking about wordsmiths. Is there a uh, synonymity, how you say it, synonymity between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven? Yeah, that's one earlier I said it was uh, that the two were synonymous. I think you even used that word synonymous. So the, uh -huh. the quality of being synonymous would be synonymity. Right. Brother Jordan says we might expect a timeless God to have many already and not yet promises and fulfillments. Good stuff. Amen. That's all you hear on Bible talk is good stuff. Praise God. And uh, I tell you, there's power coming out of the out of the chat area. There's power coming out of our guest today, Brother Rodney Smith. Praise God. I'm just along for the ride today. I don't feel like I've got anything really to do. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, it says, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, Jesus is, is explaining the parable. He said, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. So we don't know who it is that's going to respond to the word of God. We don't know where the hard hearts are, where the, where the shallow hearts are or where the good heart is. So we as sowers of God's word, we must broadcast, we must sow the gospel. We must sow the seed to all hearers. Jesus was in the boat and he taught the multitude on the shore that was a mixed crowd. But among those were sprinkled his disciples. So it is, uh, some seed, which is, which is the, the gospel of the kingdom or the word of the kingdom. And the ground here then is introduced as the hearts of people. Is that right, Brother Rodney? Am I looking at that right? Yes, brother. I would say that uh, you're looking at that right. One interesting aspect here is that uh, we see now that the seed represents the word of God, the message of the kingdom of salvation, um, of, of, of God's kingdom and our call to repent. And so we see that uh, in this parable, this, the, the seed, which represents the word of God, is sown in all these different kind of terrains, um, giving us a picture that uh, the word of God, the gospel, is to be broadly sown, broadly broadcast and 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 preach to whosoever will hear it and not as you said not everyone will receive it and not everyone will be saved but our responsibility is as jesus did i mentioned earlier at the beginning of his ministry he just publicly proclaimed the time is fulfilled the time is here repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand repent and believe the gospel so the calling is for everyone but the um the effect of that the word of god has on everyone to, on each individual depends on how it is received. So this first one was um, the wayside. And, and as you read, Jesus says the wicked one comes and snatches it away. Um, I can speak a little bit later about the three different um, uh, the three different ways that the word is ineffective on, on in people's hearts. But this first particular one was particularly attributed to the wicked one snatching it away so probably through i'm thinking temptation offering sin and this person quickly trades out the gospel of salvation for some sort of contemporary pleasure or power or profit here and now 
Right, and and also because the word has been sown uh, in, in this particular heart is by the wayside. You know that the way is the road, so it's by the roadside. Uh, the the ground is packed; it's hard. This seed does not even take any root; it just lies there until the wicked one takes it away. Right. Uh, and then verse 20 says, but he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. Now we've all seen these people uh, who are just very excited about becoming a Christian, very excited about Christ, about uh, the word of God and all things in the kingdom. At first, yet hath he not root in himself, but uh, uh, but dureth for a while, or he endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Uh, so, you know, this is another kind of a heart. We have two kinds of hearts here. One heart is just a hard packed heart. The seed does not even take root. The second kind of heart is a heart that receives it with joy at first, but uh, there's something here that is interesting. The same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it, Yet hath he no root in himself. It seems to be a flaw in the in the heart, the flaw in the ground. There is no no root, or there is no opportunity for the root to penetrate uh, very deep. But endureth for a while. For a while, it looks good. For a while, it looks like he's going to flourish. But then tribulation comes and persecution ariseth because of the word of God. You know, a lot of people want to serve Christ if it doesn't cost them anything. They want to serve Christ if uh, they don't lose any friends, if, they, if it doesn't cause any ripple in their family. But if we are true servants of Christ, we're going to have persecution. And that persecution is going to come in areas that hurt, that, that, that's painful. But people, many people will give up Christ before they'll give up a friend or give up Christ before they give up family, mother or father. I see Brother Ravi here, Brother Lanka. It's so good to have you with us. Amen. If you are in countries that are not Christian, like uh, maybe a Muslim country or a Hindu country, and where becoming a Christian costs you, costs you neighbors, costs you family, costs you friends, costs you social standing. I think that might be the heart, the kind of heart that the person that then give up Christ rather than go through all of that. That might be the kind of heart that's being talked about here that has no root in himself. Brother Rodney. Yeah, amen. I that's that's good. I agree with that. And um, I want just to add a little bit to it. I think in these first two here we see the kind of person, the kind of individual that did not um, actually receive and commit, who did not actually commit to the word of God and to the kingdom of God and indeed to God himself. Um, so a, a little bit of comparison, whereas the first one hears the word, the, the seed that fell by the wayside hears the word um, and then either rejects it or maybe takes it as something to consider like oh well, well i'll consider it and and you know sometimes when we 
we don't really take something seriously. And, oh, I'll consider that. And then we get about our own business. Um, we don't a lot of times have uh, we, a, lot, a lot of times we don't really have time to consider it or easily forget about it. But it's not really received. Now, the second one kind of appears to receive it. Right. Jesus says he receives it uh, joyfully, but there's no depth that that phrase, no depth. Um, is also synonymous with another term, shallow. So this is very shallow. And so, whereas this person received the, uh, the, the seed that fell on stony ground, receives the word initially and saying, yeah, this all sounds great. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to dedicate my life to. Yet that last piece of actually dedicating their life and putting it into practice, that is what fails to happen. So the person is not um verbally unserious about the word of god and verbally sort of not receiving it on the surface uh, as the as in the first one the seed that fell by the wayside but the second one the seed that fell on stony ground receives it at first and appears to um begin to follow jesus but as as the text says quickly falls away when it is time to put it into practice because we know that Jesus says things like, uh, in the world, you will have tribulation. And um, uh, see, if, if, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because I have chosen you out of the world, the world hates you. Um, and all of those things, we know that the scripture tells us over and over again to endure hard times, to endure persecution, to endure tribulation and suffering, suffer for Jesus um, in more places that I can even list right now. Um, and so... Doing the word of God is what is failed here in the second time. They hear the word of God and even receive it into their heart and intellectually, and, and they even get buy-in. You know, The first group does not get buy-in. The second group, yeah, I, I agree, sign me up. But when push comes to shove and times get, you know, it gets real serious, it's time to put your money where your mouth is, this is where, oh, well, you know, and, and and they back off then it's sort of you know i'll say one thing and then when it's time to make good on that i pull back that idea of putting your hands to the plow and then looking back that i mentioned earlier that jesus said so the second group here the seed that falls by the wayside yeah they shallowly receive the word and even commit to it you know perhaps perhaps verbally or for a while maybe even in some of their actions but when it comes to, to putting the word of God into practice and letting it change you, internalizing it and beginning to make it part of who you are, conforming yourself to the kingdom. Well, that's where this, uh, you know, this, this second group bows out and does not want to be changed by the word that they have received. Amen. Then in verse 22, and we're in the last, uh, the last part of our, time here today my time really has flown today in verse 22 he says he also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the decept the deceptfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful so, you know, when we look at where Jesus uh, introduced this, it's in verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up, sprung up and choked them. Uh, so here we have a different kind of ground, a different kind of heart. It's a kind of heart that receives the word of God and actually takes root but the ground is not cleared of the weeds of the world. So here we have a believer who has believed on Christ, who has received the word of God, but they're wanting, they're wanting the world too. They're, they're, they're wanting the thorns and, and the briars and, and the thistles. They haven't cleared the ground. The seed has fallen among these other things. And you know, if the world is not clean, cleared out of your life, if the cares of this world, riches, the, the desire for riches, the drive for riches, 
fame uh, and fortune and pleasure, <clears throat> uh, worldly pleasure, if these things are not cleared out, they will eventually choke out the word of God that uh, is in our life. So that's what we have here in this third kind of heart. Brother Rodney? Yeah, amen. Amen, Bishop. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And uh, in contrast to the first two um, kinds, types of hearts in this parable, these second two are those who actually take the word of God seriously and begin to, um, well, commit to putting the word of God to practice in their into practice in their own lives and um, dedicating themselves to con being conformed to the kingdom of God and being conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. They really desire um, to belong to God and to become like God. And so there's obviously a contrast between this the seed that fell among thorny ground and the seed that fell on good ground, which I which we'll get to. Um, but I think the first the first two, the wayside and the stony ground, those were more mm, the world being chosen over God. Yet in this in this second group, the, the thorny ground and the good ground, we see God being chosen over the world. But yet there still is caution because Jesus mentions two things, the deceitfulness of riches, so the pursuit of wealth, and the cares of this life. Um, I think it's 2 Timothy 2 where, where Paul uh, uh, admonishes Timothy, uh, a soldier does not concern himself to entangle himself in the affairs of the, this world um, so that he can please him who, who enlisted him as a soldier. He tells Timothy to to live as a good, to be a good soldier. Of That's Jesus right. Christ. Yeah. Sure. And so um, this third caution is the life. And I pray all the time, you know, in our, in our, how do you say, uh, individualistic society where everyone has to make their own way. But yet in our um, type of economy that can bring tough times on us sometimes that I don't become like this, this, this uh, third warning of Jesus. In fact, we should all pray and and be aware and alert that we don't become like any of these first three. This, that's why Jesus gives us these warnings here in Scripture. Um, but this third one is not necessarily, I think, about, you know, forget God. Let me go after this as much money and greed and women and sin and all these things I can get. No, it's about, well, you know, everybody around me, you know, airport, this they have to have this portfolio, this retirement. This is what our culture does. This is the good pursuit. This is the good thing. I need to be here. I need to get here. I have goals. I have, and then the cares of this life. I have bills to pay. I have errands to run. I have all these things. And they're all good things, but they can become too much. And they can take the place of God. And even unintentionally, your heart might be to follow God. But yet, we are. you're in this cycle of being overwhelmed. We're called to not be overwhelmed and pushed down by all these worldly cares that again, in and of themselves are good things because they can choke the word of God to where we do not become fruitful. And we don't right. want that to be the basis of our judgment. Our priority needs to be the work of the kingdom right. being about God's business. Matthew six thirty three. you know, uh, seek first the kingdom, seek first, Jesus said, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added to you. That's right. the position of faith that we need to take. We need to be able to trust God with all those things. But if we try to make it happen ourselves, we could easily become overwhelmed. And the word of God and our effectiveness in God can be in the kingdom of God can be choked out. And that, I think, is the warning here in the seed that falls among thorny ground. Amen. And it says unfruitful. You know, we can't. And you mentioned that that just sort of is, is glaring at me. Uh, the idea is the ground produces fruit. The first type of ground or heart, it didn't even take root. The second type of ground or heart, it took root but didn't last long in the face of the sun, trials and tests. 
the third ground, the cares of this life. And, you know, they, they don't necessarily have to be sinful, as Brother Rodney pointed out. It could just be doing what you, you think is, is good things, but so much so that you're just unfruitful for the kingdom of God. Now we get to the fourth type of ground or the fourth kind of heart. So we read about it in verse eight, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Now we go over to verse 23 is the explanation of that. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. My, what a beautiful place to end this study today. Uh, and uh, Brother Jordan said, same grace on all soils. Our heart posture determines the result of the seed. What a great truth that is. Our heart posture, the condition of our heart, determines the result of the seed. Now, Jesus, of these four kinds of grounds, he only says one of them is good ground. He only said one of them is good ground. The seed was broadcast and sown to all kinds of ground, all kinds of hearts and lives. Hear the word of God. But only one fourth of the seed fell on good ground. Only one fourth of the seed fell upon good hearts that had a good posture, hearts that had a right attitude toward God. And the thing that I, I want to emphasize here, probably it's because I don't know if Brother Fred is still with us or not, but I'm in agreement with Brother Fred. I am a recovering legalist. I was raised in one that's Pentecostalism and very legalistic. Uh, we could not, men could not have facial hair. Uh, we could not wear short sleeves. We had to wear long sleeves even in the summertime. Had to work in long sleeves. Um, very, a very legalistic group that I grew up in. So I have sort of gravitated away from salvation by works, but I still feel a strong tug. I feel still feel a strong pull toward outward holiness. I do. I really do. And uh, I was taught, as many of you were taught, that at the rapture or at death, if you were not 100%, if you were not producing at 100%, you would be lost. You would be lost. Now, I don't think you are hearing me. You would be lost. It was a lordship type of atonement teaching that taught that if Jesus was not Lord of every corner of your life, then he was not Lord at all. And you would, if there was any area of your life that where Jesus was not made Lord, that you would be lost. Now, I believe in lordship theology, that Christ must be, the Bible teaches that, 
He is our Lord. Jesus is Lord. I believe in uh, ransom atonement. I believe that he paid my ransom. But I really, really believe in penal substitutionary atonement. I don't think that we have to give up one for the other. I think that the Bible teaches all of it. But the Bible teaches all of it amalgamated together and with, uh, with a sprinkling of, uh, of uh, sanctified sins. Yes, Jesus is Lord, but I know that I'm human. And I know that there's areas in my life that I struggle with the Lordship of Christ. And if you were honest, you would tell me the same thing. Yes, you would. So this, this right here gives me comfort. This last verse, this last type of heart, this last type of ground gives me hope because the good ground, the good heart doesn't produce the same. Some of the good ground are capable of producing a hundredfold. Some of the good ground only produces 60-fold. And some of the good ground, God bless their hearts, they're that worldly bunch, they only produce 30-fold. But they're still good ground. The 30-folders, the 60-folders, they're still good ground, just like the 100-fold. So that I can accept my brother, who is not where I am, in spirituality, in, in pro productivity in the kingdom. I hope my brother who is, who is the hundred folder can accept me and I'm just striving to be a good 60 folder and God help me to accept the 30 folder person who doesn't even look like a Christian to me. But hey, on the good ground, there's the hundredfold, there's the sixtyfold, and there's the thirtyfold. Folks, I'm not making this up. This is the truth with my hand up. Amen. Brother Fred says, I had a pastor that said he would hate to have served God faithfully his entire life, only to utter a curse word at the end and die and go to hell. No grace at all. Look, Sister Lisa said that's terrible, Frederick. Thank God for grace. Thank God for the blood covenant. Thank God that, that, that my blood covenant partner takes up my slack. He's righteous. 100% of the time, my blood covenant partner, which is Jesus Christ. He's holy. Some days, most of the days I think I am, but some days I know I'm not. Some days, Jerry Hayes just gets in my way. And I thank God that my blood covenant partner takes up my slack. He's in that other collar of that yoke. And I know we're going over today. Forgive us. I'm, Brother Rodney, I'm going to let you have the final word here in just a second. But you see, when I was young, Brother Fred, I'm sure you and, and Sister Lisa and, and some of the others that are here today, I'm sure that, and, and Brother Jordan and my, uh, you know, some of you have had the same experience. I heard a lot about the yoke. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. But the preachers didn't have an inkling of an idea of what a yoke was. Or if they did, they certainly didn't tell us. Now, I told you that I'm a farm boy, raised that way. We had milk cows. I told you about that. Well, we'd usually always have one cow that liked to get out. She would like to get loose, push through the fence. What they would do is they would get their chest against the fence and they'd rock back and forth and push and push and push until they pushed the fence over and they could just walk, walk over, walk through the fence. Well, the way that we would solve that is we would hobble the cow with a yoke, what we called a yoke. This is the only kind of yoke I knew anything about. We would take a sapling that had a fork in it up so far, and then the fork cut it down. And we would put that fork around the cow's neck and tie it across the top of the neck with something like bobbed wire so that when the yoke moved, it would cut the cow and, and cause the cow a little pain uh, to be uncomfortable. And then the, 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 the bottom part of the Y the 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 upward shaft of the y would actually drag the ground unless the cow held her head up and this pretty much solved her jumping the fence or or pushing through the fence and that's the only yoke that i understood anything about and when the preacher preached about my yoke and that i should carry my yoke and i should be yoked up you know, that's that's the only imagery I had in mind. And I guarantee you, that's the only imagery that any of the other saints in the congregation had in mind. It was a hobbling device. Imagine my surprise when I found that where the Bible talks about the yoke, it's talking about an ox yoke. And there are two oxen in the yoke. There's an oxen in the right collar and an oxen in the left collar. And these oxen pull in tandem. They pull together. So when we talk of when the Bible talks about a yoke, it's talking about this ox yoke that I'm in one collar, but my yoke partner is Jesus Christ and he's in the other collar. And when the load gets too hard for, hard for me to pull, my yoke partner takes up my slack. My yoke partner makes up my lack. I was a grown man before I understood this about my relationship with Jesus Christ. To me, God was sitting on a throne looking for a reason to send me to hell after I had done the best that I knew how to do. Imagine the joy when I understood, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, it is the gift of God, least any man should boast. Here, the good ground doesn't produce the same. Christians in the church that are all good ground are not all going to be 100%. They're not even all going to be 60%. Some of them barely get to church, barely keep from cussing. Sometimes maybe they even don't. They only produce 30%. But they're still good ground. Still good ground. Brother Rodney put a lot of Bible verses up here for you all to check out. Let me read our, our conversation. And then, Brother Rodney, I'll turn it to you for a final word. Uh, Brother Jordan, 
says, Paul argues that the gospel does not mean God is unjust and that all sin will be punished. The gospel reveals God's justice, even though we are justified because of God purchased us with his own blood and was pleased to crush him and offer him as a sin offering to always make intercession for me Look as a lamb slain and offering a better sacrifice in a better temple with better promises. Praise God that he offered himself. That's what it's all about, isn't it? If I, if I can be 100%, there's no need for the cross. If I can be 100%, if I must be 100%, there would be no need for Calvary. And then Brother Rodney lists these verses. Brother Rodney, we have gone over. So if you will just take maybe two or three minutes here with a final word, Brother, uh, at this time. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, a lot of good stuff. I know we're on the topic of, of grace right now. Um, and this is Jesus' message in this parable. This is what he's getting to is the call for us to be fruitful. And uh, these are not contradictory because we have work to do. We have expectations, rights, and responsibilities as sons of the kingdom. Uh, but God's grace is the only way that we can even have part of it. Indeed, we're also saved on the basis. We're saved by faith. We recognize that as well. So in that list of scriptures that I put in there, um, I would encourage everyone to go through that list in um, studying this parable, at, at least in this last part, the good ground. Um, because I wouldn't want to read all of those here in this time. But, um, of course, this parable was Matthew 13, 1 to 23. And um, I think it's very important to not break up this passage. When, when you're teaching on this parable, um, uh, uh, studying it, I think it's a mistake to go and uh, this is kind of like my conclusion, but I still need to mention the good ground real quick. But um, I could have started with this as well. But it's very important that uh, it's a, it, to not break up this passage. I think it's a mistake to, you know, do a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount and make each one um, the, a, a, particular, uh, a particular one of these types of hearts or types of grounds. Um, unless, of course, we're reading and studying the whole parable every single time. So that that's not the mistake is in breaking it up in isolation from the others because this is a unit meant to be <coughs> all together and so jesus point that he gets here to is the call to fruitfulness the call for us to be dedicated and perhaps to be fully devoted and dedicated to him the call to be his disciple and that is in a re relational term uh that is a description of our relationship with him as his disciples uh, perhaps a better another way to say it is instead of you know not not being fully 100 percent is that maybe you know being fully 100 percent devoted but yet not all of us are going to be 100 fold i'm not dissenting i'm just saying maybe that's another way to think of it but um in these passages here jesus talks about in, Matthew, in john chapter 15 fruitfulness as well he, at the end of his ministry before his uh, crucifixion he tells his disciples i'm the vine you're the branches unless you abide in me you cannot do anything and this in, in this my father is pleased that you bear much fruit i listed verses one to eight and verse eight ends this way by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples the disciples in other words so another word of saying that that's synonymous is in this way, this is how you will be my disciples. A disciple is one who puts the word of God into practice. Um, and we know that uh, you know, from Acts chapter 13, that a disciple is synonymous with Christian. Amen. All right. Was that your final word, my brother? I don't know if we lost him or he got cut off or what. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, yeah, let me end on this. Those other passages I suggest that you go read. It, 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 it 
goes from fruit bearing into how then do we do that? The James ones, the James passages talk about being doers of the word and not hearers only and not merely having faith without works. Faith without works is dead, but we are to, the example given, to provide other brothers and sisters what they need when they have a need. So when we get down to the other ones, First John, First Corinthians, and John, um, at the end of that list, those are all about love. Being his disciple is about loving one another, providing for one another. The end of 1 Corinthians 12 says this. It says, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And if you keep reading on into verse 13, I mean, chapter 13, because there was no, um, you know, division in the, in the original that Paul wrote, it, it continues to say, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not, what? Love. 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 So he's showing us the more excellent way, the way of the Christian life, the way of a disciple of Jesus Christ is the way of love and taking care of others. If we want to give our love back to God and show our devotion to him, then we can give our love and our care and our attention to those. God doesn't need anything, but to those God cares about. When we show our love to and our love in action. As it says, look up the first John uh, 16 to 18, love in deed and in truth, not only in word and in tongue. When we give our love to God's children, that's special to the heart. Yeah. Amen. That's what it's to Amen. be in the sight of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Rodney. It has been wonderful having you with us. This is our, our first time to bring on a guest such as yourself. And I think everyone has enjoyed it. I have really enjoyed it. We're definitely going to have you back uh, in the future. Uh, you are so articulate and uh, you can carry a thought just right straight through to the heart of it. So God bless you and thank you for being here. Those of you thank that you are... Me, Bishop. I didn't mention that I was uh, on the board of Monotheism Mandate with you and my main website is... Uh... Out of the many is wordwarriors.org, but uh, you have me tagged in this video. So if anybody wants to contact me, it's at wordwarrior007 on Facebook and on YouTube. But um, thank you so much, brother. I always enjoy talking with you. And thank you, everyone, for putting up with my, uh, my, cold, my cold voice <laughs> that I have right now. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless and thank you always. Amen. Bible says, know them that labor among you. We know Brother Rodney. We've labored with him for many, many years in the gospel. Praise God. So look, uh, be sure to like and share this video. If you haven't shared it already, would you do that right now? We're having anywhere from 600 to 1,000 people every day that watches Bible Talk and having two, three, four shares. Come on. Folks, we can do better than that. Help me out. Send me some love. Share Bible Talk. And uh, if you're not following me on uh, Facebook, follow me. Uh, we uh, transfer these to uh, our uh, YouTube channel. They're about a week late. They appear over on YouTube about a week late. You can catch them over there as well. You can catch the reruns. Praise God. And uh, let's hear from you in uh, the line of sharing and liking and subscribing and all like that. Help us get the word out. Lord bless you. Until next time, it's my prayer that the Lord sanctify you wholly in your mind, in your body, and also in your spirit. And until next time, Godspeed, my friends.